Excellent. So I'm going to be talking to you about or giving you guys some tips and tricks using the Dataverse Connector in Power Automate. Yes, I realize that's a very uh, word heavy title. Maybe I could have used Chat GPT to make it more concise, but oh well, here we are. Um, so for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Chris Piasecki. I'm a principal consultant and uh, recently founder. I, I started off my own sort of consulting um, firm. I used to work for um, a large uh, Microsoft partner for several years prior to that, um, but then decided to take the leap um, just fairly recently and I've been I'm loving that ever since. But um, I come from a developer pro dev background, as you could say, but um, more recently I'm working as sort of a solution architect and of course, um, you know, definitely consulting, working for clients um, in all sorts of different industries. But I've been, my background has been in Microsoft since um, well, since I ever started my career, which has been almost 12 years as of today. But um, yeah, what hooked me in to low code was really the early roots of, which was dynamic CRM way back in the day, probably like eight or so years ago, and just being able to do the things that you can do um, without code and being able to really accelerate development was, you know, what hooked me. And just seeing how it evolved today has just been quite amazing. And so, you know, I've, I've, been ever so root, uh, deeply rooted in this community ever since. Um, I am a Microsoft Business Applications MVP. Um, I'm also a Power App Super user. Um, I also run the Edmonton Power Platform user group. Um, more recently speaking at a number of events. Um, I'm also on the Community Ambassadors Advisor Board, so kind of being a voice of the community and helping um, basically improve the Microsoft community and the community forums to help, um, you know, help improve the product, but also helping people to get you know, helpful information that they need to continue using and adopting the product. Um, and another thing, um, also Shane did show a little slide on, but I'm one of the um, co-organizers that's organizing the Canadian Power Platform Summit that is help, um, happening in Vancouver, British Columbia in next month in March. Um, and actually just a small update, I did actually have an update on that specifically. Um, the reception that we're seeing and interest in the event has just been quite amazing. And we are actually currently sold out um, as of right now. And so we, of course, are looking at ways to expand capacity for the event. No guarantees at this time, but it's something we're actively looking at. But I do highly encourage those to join the waitlist, as there are also people that may drop out for whatever reason they can't make the event. So getting on the waitlist will allow you to get first in line if if a seat becomes available. So um, for more information, you can go to CanadianPowerPlatformSummit.com. And with that, so I'll just kind of jump right into it. So I've got just kind of a few useful um, tips and tricks that'll kind of help you work with the Dataverse connector as it becomes more and more um, adopted throughout the platform, as, as Shane says, and throughout organizations getting access to Dataverse and seeing the value that it provides. And so though a, a lot of times people can get a bit intimidated by it, and sometimes there's some nuances about um, using the, the connector that is not always straightforward and requires you know, a lot of banging your head against the wall to kind of figure things out. And so hopefully I can shed some light on a few uh, common things that I see to make things easier um, as you're kind of starting on your, your journey. Uh, so the first tip I have for you today is specifically around running flows as the triggering or modifying user. And so, you know, one of the reasons that you know this becomes important, and this will be particularly familiar to those that have um, a history working with Dynamics and using the classic workflow engine, is that who the workflow runs as is very important for a lot of scenarios, especially when the workflow is maybe going and updating records inside of Dataverse. So by default, it's running as the, the owner of the workflow, and you know hopefully it, it, you are your your workflows are owned by either a service principal or a service account. Um, and rather an individual for continuity. However, um, the downside of that is that when you're going and updating any records or creating any records, it's gonna show that service principle or service account in any of the audit data. So any of the record created on or updated on fields, it's gonna be by that user and doesn't necessarily give a clear indication of who actually is the one that caused those records to be updated. So typically you want that to be who caused that workflow to trigger in the first place. And so the nice thing we can do is, is we can set the run as option to be the modifying user so that we can you know, address those problems that were previously stated. So when you go and select the run as modifying user, this will then give you the option in any downstream um, Dataverse um, 
flow actions to select what's called the use invokers connection, as you see on the right there under the three ellipses. So this will give you the flexibility to decide, okay, for these particular actions, I want to use the, um, the modifying user in order to update a particular row so that you know you you have traceability and audibility on who actually performed those actions, and also from a security role perspective, there's other implications as well. But it still always gives you the flexibility, and that maybe some actions you may still want it to run as the flow owner, which will be what kind of runs by default if you're not using the use invokers connection. So that's uh, tip number one. Uh, another tip that I don't see maybe used as frequently, but I, it is um, quite useful and has its very uh, well, uh, very specific use cases, is the delay until trigger. Now, I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with the delay until action that is not specific to Dataverse, but um, can be used to insert you know delays into your flow. Whether you know the use cases, maybe you want to um, have some delay between sending an email notification. Maybe you only want it to send during business hours and not you know, disturb people in the late hours of the night, or perhaps you're trying to orchestrate some type of batch operation in response to a key event, but don't want to impact the operational system during peak hours, whatever the reason may be, um, you may want to in introduce a delay. Now, the nice thing is by using the delay until in the Dataverse trigger, um, that's an advantage over the um, delay until action that's part of the, the, the Power Automate platform, is that you are not going to be constrained by the 30-day timeout that you see on flows, right? Because when you're running the delay until action or any sort of action, there's going to be a 30-day timeout just on the flow in general. Now, this delay until on the trigger is not subject to that because it technically hasn't triggered the flow and therefore won't be subject to that timeout. So if you need to wait some longer duration before triggering this, maybe say 30, 60 days or and it is however that may be, you can do that using this. Now, one limitation to be aware of is that you, as of right now, um, you can't use any expressions to make it um, fully dynamic in that, in that regard. So for example, if you want to use like an add days to say run it 30 days from now, uh, that won't work. However, you can ins uh, you specify a date field specifically. So perhaps you have a field inside of your Dataverse table that you want to track of one that maybe that notification needs to be sent on, you can enter that into the delay until to have it be at least dynamic in that sort of nature. Okay, third tip. And this isn't, this one is, I found that can get people into a lot of trouble and can result in a lot of frustration is relying on trigger data in downstream actions. Um, to be to be there when you need it. Um, this particularly becomes an um, important part of your design, um, especially you know, when you're working with Dataverse updates and, and, and modifications that you always want to generally trigger, the, uh, trigger these um, updates only when specific events happen or maybe when specific fields are updated. So you'll want to use you know, the select columns to only tr to specify which fields you want to um, trigger the, up, uh, the flow. And also, in conjunction with filter rows, can go into further detail to specify expressions on exactly um, what state of the data needs to be in on when it can trigger. Now, the problem can occur is that if you're referencing the triggered um, data in downstream actions, um, you can end up in a scenario where that data is empty. Uh, because, especially when you're working with um, modified events, you're only going to see columns show up that actually changed or were included as part of the update requests that occur inside of Dataverse. So in this scenario above where you see we have first name, last name, and middle name, that's being um, going to trigger an update um, or this flow to, to, to trigger on an update. If I only updated the first name and you have an action that's maybe depending on or using the last name and middle name from the trigger and it's empty, well, you're going to result in an error. So, in order to work around this and and safeguard, um, you'll you'll always want to use a follow up get row by ID in order to get the full record or whatever the, the the columns that you need. In this case, the same ones that are part of the trigger and maybe any additional ones that you want to include, and then reference that one downstream inside of your flow. That way, you won't have to uh, worry about whether the data is going to actually you know be there or not. Well. Of course, that's not guaranteeing that necessarily the data is not null, but at least you'll know at that time um, you can uh, you can account for that um, specifically. 
but also another advantage is you'll have the most up-to-date state of that particular record because with flow being asynchronous in nature there could be some delay between one that you know trigger um, occurs and or the execution of that flow occurs and there may have been subsequent updates that have occurred since then so by doing a get row you'll want you'll actually ensure that hey, you're getting the most up-to-date state of that particular record Um, tip number four, and this is probably one of my more favorite ones, is the use of fetch XML. And for those that are not um, familiar with fetch XML, it is a querying language that is native to and specific to Dataverse that is used to construct more complex querying um, and retrieving of data, um, especially when it comes to joining data sets. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware if you're using the list rows um, with just a normal select columns and filter rows, it's going to be quite challenging and tedious if you need to work with related data um, across you know, parents or child records. You may have to construct multiple list rows and somehow manually join the data, which is not necessarily efficient from an APL, API calls perspective and from a performance perspective. And so what you can do is use Fetch XML instead to um, provide a more uh, uh, provide a more complex query, uh, more efficiency, allows you to do things like inner and outer joins so that you can kind of mash up data from say both um, a parent and child record. So for in this example, you have maybe um, a user's table and you have a team's table and you wanna retrieve all um, users that are part of a particular team. And so you can um, prov provide things like filtering and conditions as well for more advanced scenarios. And that allows you to, again, work with the data in, all, in one call um, and make things a lot easier. And you know, to make it, of course, as, as Fetch XML, as you can see, it is XML based and it may look a bit intimidating. Um, the nice thing is there are many great community tools. Uh, one that I highly recommend is the Fetch XML Builder from the XRM toolbox that can be used to actually build and construct your Fetch XML queries and test them before then bringing them inside to Power Automate and, and testing them um, inside of there and using them. And so that's a great tool to make it um, less uh, daunting to work with uh, that if you're not someone that's um, um, you know, comfortable working directly with XML or not maybe a developer. Um, and just kind of a uh, uh, this, this last and final tip I have that's a little bit more narrow um, and specific, but one I've found that I've ran into frequently, especially if you're working with file or image columns inside of Dataverse and need to retrieve additional information about that file metadata, you'll find that if you're downloading a file or image, you're not going to get anything additional inside of that. So you'll get the actual binary content of the image, but if you need to get something like the file name, the file type, the file size, things like that, um, you're going to not you're going to be disappointed to see that that information is not going to be available in the output of that download a file or image um, action. Now, one way that we can get around this is basically we need to go into what's called the file attachments table. And this so the file attachments table will will actually store a reference to the files that are being uploaded inside of Dataverse. So as many of you may know, the file actual file content is now stored in blob storage, so outside of the transactional database, but a reference to the actual record, um, including any of its metadata, such as the file name, file size, file, you know, MIME content type, are all stored inside of the file attachments. And so in order to get to that data, um, one, we would need, first of all, access to that particular um, file or image column that's inside of your table. So in this particular case, we have accounts and it has the entity image, which is the main image of the record. So if we go ahead and get that entity image, what it'll return is actually a GUID or the, the ID of the record that's going to be referenced inside of the file attachments table. And so once we retrieve that entity image, uh, the GUID to the basically the pointer to that attachment record in the file attachment table, we can do a, a list rows action, and we can basically specify the file attachment IDs equal to the basically the outputs, the ID that comes up from selecting this entity image um, column. And then we can go and get access to the additional metadata, whether that's the file name, the file size, and so on. And so that's a nice little, um, again, more narrow and more specific um, tip but something that I found to be very useful when having to frequently uh, work with files after we brought them in and move them around and things like that. Um, so again, those are just some nice, easy 
um, guidance on in terms of how to use flow with Dataverse. Of course, there's a lot more that we can do, and this is probably a topic all on its own. I could probably spend an hour talking about it, but unfortunately, I only had about 10 minutes or so to go into that. So just a few examples of how you can get started. But um, there's some great documentation on Microsoft Learn on how to use the different types of actions and triggers inside of Flow. So I highly recommend checking that out. Um, if you're not already familiar, it's a good starting point. And of course, there's always lots of great community blogs and stuff out there that goes into more um, advanced scenarios, kind of like the file specific one I talked about at the end there. Uh, so with that, um, yeah, thanks for for having me. It's actually great to be um, presenting on this on this again. Actually, the last time I think I was on was I think when we did this live at the Orlando MP MPPC in 2022. So it's uh, great to be back and uh, great to see all of you folks um, again. Mm -hmm.